for their second presentation. Okay. All right, so I'm going to launch into 100,000 years of history and do it in 10 minutes or so. So uh, it's uh, <laughs> quite a task. So uh, what I want to do is look at history differently through a cognitive lens, which means through how we've uh, used our consciousness. And I think this looks at history differently because we tend to think of ourselves as the latest, greatest iteration of the humans, whereas this recognizes that for 30, 40,000 years, our brains have been formed already and that the contexts are different. And so we can learn from history in a different way than just through the winners and the losers uh, of how we've described it. So wanting to jump through uh, this history and to see, all right, so, uh, Homo sapiens, that's us, uh, as opposed to the green, which is the Homo erectus and the Neanderthals, the last couple hundred thousand years. Sorry to interrupt, Ted. Are you able to share presenter view? Uh, the slides are hard to see in this format. Uh, can you see? We can, we can see your screen. So if you could go to the top and click use slideshow, that would be helpful. We're so at the very top to the left. Uh, it says stop share. Uh, no, go to your PowerPoint. In your actual presentation, yeah. on your PowerPoint, yeah. it'll say it, there's a button that says end show. Next to it, it says use slideshow. And I think that's what you need to be clicking uh -huh. so that it's large sized. Oh, is that better? Nope, now we lost you entirely. So share screen again. Uh, where are you? Share screen. Okay. Okay, and now if you go to Yep, that should, there you go. Okay. Yep, so, good. Okay, <laughs> so even quicker. So uh, what I want to highlight are these four different uh, time periods as representing a significant change in how we've engaged as humans in these different contexts. Uh, the most significant evolution was the cognitive revolution uh, 30 to 70,000 years ago when humans began to uh, change in their language and uh, develop this ability that we now have. And uh, so it's, it's recent in big history, but it takes us to a whole different way. Uh, so this cognitive revolution, the theorists uh, say that we changed from uh, animals and began using language. And uh, they think it was a, an evolution of uh, sharing knowledge. Lots of animals can use different sounds that represent uh, different warning or excitement and so on. Somehow we uh, leapt to being able to be more descriptive. Uh, there's a lion down by the river, we need to chase it away or we need to run away. And so we uh, changed, uh, evolved language to be more descriptive for ourselves rather than getting eaten. The other theory is that gossip, uh, sharing information about each other in our small groups uh, changed our language. We need to know who's, has, whose strengths and weaknesses we could depend on. And so these are the theories of how uh, language came to us. Uh, in, in the midst of this language, uh, looking at the wonderment, looking at the stars, and we began to tell stories about this wonderment of, and uh, how the stars are connected, literally connecting the dots. And so the root stories of uh, hunter-gatherers, that nature is a loving parent, uh, nature's my family, we're all connected. Uh, we all have relations with the spirits. So there wasn't religion per se, because everyone lived in a spiritual interconnected way. This was 
uh, how early folks uh, looked at the world. Around 30, 40,000 years ago, symbolic expressions, this zoomorphic sculpture represents a, a leap forward in using symbolism uh, to describe our interconnection. Uh, cave art uh, was part of this evolution. Uh, this ostrich egg was carved as a way to represent to other groups um, friendship. And so if food was scarce in my area, I, I had, uh, was able to redeem these uh, ostrich uh, egg sculptures. Uh, we recognize from these early folks that they lived primarily in groups of 50 to 100 people and had different values and uh, uh, belief systems. One group was uh, evolved around a nuclear family. Others had an open family structure. Um, some accepted homosexualities, others didn't. Uh, but we recognize how highly intelligent uh, these folks were in terms of understanding their bioregion. They were using their brains to full capacity to uh, understand how the rhythms of nature worked for them. So um, a brilliant use of thinking. And this was a, when I, one of the characteristics is men and women being equal. And when I Googled this, this is what <laughs> came forward. So kind of a silly representation. But what this represents is that in these small groupings, the alpha males were contained uh, by the, the broader community. So if an alpha male became too aggressive, uh, they uh, stamped down on uh, the alpha males and contain them. Um, and so this created more equality in these smaller groupings. So we jumped to agriculture. Uh, agriculture represented this cultivation of grain that probably happens by grain, wild grain sprinkling beside a path and them recognizing that they could do this year after year, which then led to permanent sale, sell, settlements. Um, one of the downfalls was in changing their diet to uh, these grains was people were less healthy than the hunter gatherers. And uh, this created more infant mortality, but because they're in smaller settlements and so on, they were able to have more children. So it was a, a compensation of uh, more food, but less nutritious food and therefore less healthy. Again, the whole ancient civilizations um, and essentially the alpha males uh, gain control because they're in bigger groups than 150. And uh, so they could dominate um, patriarchal hierarchy, separations of tasks, uh, complicated organizations, uh, fueled by the calories produced through agriculture. And so we see the world uh, uh, as it changed and evolved with different philosophies and different takes. And, uh, the Chinese with one and Greece and our Judeo-Christian understanding in the middle there. This represents a timeline uh, from, uh, I mentioned the spiritual interconnectedness to polytheism uh, as agriculture came into the fore, began to see wind and fire and water and represented as different spiritual entities. Uh, as civilizations come along, then we shift into uh, monotheism, which kind of represented the shift to patriarchal hierarchy. And so uh, the divine was understood uh, in this monotheistic way, similar to how culture was evolving. One of the huge backdrops to our thinking is uh, Socrates and Plato and dualistic thinking. And then we begin to get the separation of gods and humans and mind, body and humans and nature. And uh, this has had a profound influence, still does. Uh, transcendent God versus material world. We still uh, live within that perspective. So and this changed in the, or evolved in the scientific era. Uh, these big names, Galileo, in terms of understanding the relationship to the earth and the sun. And so it, it had a huge impact on religion because uh, the notion had been God was up on the clouds and above and heaven and all that. And so science was a huge threat to this imaginary imaging of heaven and God and so on. Uh, Newton changes uh, how we see the world through gravity. And he presented this mechanistic understanding of the world, that world is like a, a clock. Uh, deists understood God as a clockmaker, 
and our bodies are different parts that can be interchanged, changed a profound way. Uh, Bacon uh, emphasized the power of domination of humans over nature, that we could subdue things, colonialism, um, rationalization of this domination. Printing press, reformation, changed the relationship again with God and the church and uh, each one of us. Uh, Descartes accentuated this separation of mind and body and uh, I think therefore I am. This kind of dualism we know has led us forward. Uh, 19th century thinkers, Marx, Nietzsche, Freud, all had significant look at uh, how we understand the world around us. Harari and Sapiens identifies these three uh, humanist religions, liberal towards the individual, socialist, uh, the collective understanding and evolutionary humanism, uh, where one group of humans is more evolved than another. This led to Nazism and the rise of the Aryan race over others. And, and uh, we see that uh, strand still accentuated uh, in our society. Uh, with nationalist kind of thinking. So these are the three dominant strains of humanism that we carry forward. And of course, the industrial revolutions, first, second, third, fourth that we're in now um, in the digital economy, population growth, welfare state, uh, different um, change in understanding of how the state related to each one of us. Um, our Anglo approach is means tested as opposed to the Scandinavian one that uh, is more inclusive of all. Uh, significant understanding of the role of government in relationship to each other, which leads us to this ideal, uh, the vision, the post war image of us um, suburban homes, car, boat, trailer, on vacation, the kind of ideal bubble that uh, has often presented of, as the, the great reward. In the last um, 30, 40 years, we've begun to see the slide as um, it's led to these kinds of traffic jams, uh, free market, uh, Reagan and Thatcher and neoliberal uh, freeing of the market and consumerism, things that we now question, uh, we recognize Things like Exxon uh, knew about climate change and actively resisted it, as well as big plastic. Uh, incredible inequality. These men, uh, six uh, men, have more wealth than half of the world's population. Uh, the stock market crash, the roller coaster, uh, the reality that we're presently in uh, with the coronavirus, but also the fluctuation of the economy. So is it really where we want to be? All day long we hear the news story of uh, reporting on business as the central organizing aspect of our life. So this is, uh, if you look at it from a philosophical standpoint, is uh, this is what this woman is commenting on. We're, we're all separate from each other. We're all selfish. Nature is a machine. Technology is a solution. Everything is meaningless, fill it with consumerism. Is that the background message of, of what we're hearing? Um, carbon in the atmosphere. So is this a time of the end of the capitalist era? Is it an opportunity to think differently at our historical picture? Uh, is the eco commoning period this time of uh, liminal change that we're in? Is there an opportunity out of these challenges? Can we look at this history differently and see that groupings of 50 and 100 people, neighborhoods, is a good way to organize, that it brings more equality, that we can have different values and perspectives that are different to what commons group? Uh, can we be interrelated and highly intelligent in our bioregionalism? Uh, do we need to look at our root stories again, uh, understanding? The nature is a loving uh, parent. Uh, we're all in a, a wonderful family that we're interrelated. So there's lots of history that we can understand and look at uh, and pick apart and see the benefits of science and see the benefits of, of 
where we've come and all of our advancements, but we don't have to do it in a linear kind of track. There's all kinds of experiments that are going on. And uh, in the third section, I'll explore them more thoroughly. But I wanted to give this snapshot of history to uh, say that we can look deeply at who we are as humans, and uh, that provides a framework, a, a way to think differently about where we've been and where we need to go. So do I have the, I think I have the questions, oh, yes. Uh, so when you look back at the scope of our uh, cognitive history, uh, what can you leave behind? Uh, what do we want to carry forward into this next period? So let's uh, take some time to reflect on these things. Okay, so I'm going to put you back into your breakout rooms. Um, and I, I don't know what happens to people who weren't in the first ones, but we'll try to figure that out once we send other folks in. The question is in the chat box. Uh, please be sure to enter your chat in your chat box and then bring it back with you. See you in 10 minutes. Accept your invitation when you receive it.